Good morning, and I want to welcome you to our very, very special Palm Sunday service as we consider through the magnificent music you are about to hear and the spoken word, as we consider the last words that Christ spoke from the cross. We're happy that you're here with us in the sanctuary, happy for those who are watching with us on television. Have just a couple of announcements to make. Uh, don't forget, immediately following the service, we will hold our annual Easter egg hunt and hot dog feast inside this year. Uh, though, though, uh, uh, please go to the atrium where Kim English will direct the children where uh, they are to hunt their eggs. And everyone is invited to come to Fellowship Hall and eat uh, a hot dog either before, during, or after the hunt. This Thursday at noon and then at 6 p.m. we will be having our uh, Monday Thursday service with communion. Uh, both services will be in our chapel. Next Sunday, of course, uh, is Easter Sunday. And as usual, we will have two identical services at 8.30 and 10.30 here in the sanctuary. Finally, our prayer concern uh, for this week includes Fred Lauder, who is in the hospital down in Dallas. And also our prayers go to Cezanne and Charles McCullough on the death of Cezanne's aunt, Bessie Faye Marshall, who died this past week in Amarillo. as you are able for the call to worship. Jesus entered the streets of Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. Jesus came not as a ruler nor a king, but as the Savior. Let's all join in praising our Savior with a joyful song. If you would all join us in singing hymn number 280, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
be seated. Scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Listen now for God's word as we hear about the procession. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to ask you as you're in on the registration pads so that we will know that you are here today. I want to uh, ask you also at this point to take a moment to uh, share the gift of Christ's love with those around you. Our worship continues as we receive the offering, the tithes that we bring unto the Lord for the work of his church here and around the world. Let us pray. O oh God, we offer these gifts from our hands to your hands, from our hearts to your heart, that you might be known in all that they do and accomplish. Amen.
be seated.
Have you ever been part of a large crowd of people? Maybe you were going to a concert or maybe uh, an athletic contest. Uh, maybe you were going to a grand opening. But if you've ever been in a large crowd of people, you know that not everybody is there for the same reason. In fact, some people can't even tell you really why they are there. Maybe they're just curious and want to see uh, what everybody else is excited about. This in part explains how things could change so quickly only days after Jesus rode into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday to the shouts of Hosanna. Now there are shouts to crucify him. And indeed, the first words that Jesus spoke from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think those words at that particular point in time were directed to those people who thought that they could get rid of Jesus and all of his followers by crucifying him. In that crowd that first Palm Sunday, there were those who were believers. There were those who were excited that Jesus was coming to the holy city. But there were those who believed that if they could just arrest and get rid of Jesus, then that would be the end of that and all of his followers. But of course, we know that is not the case and was not the case because here we are, 2,000 years later, worshiping the living Christ. But while Jesus may have been addressing those who believed that they could get rid of Jesus as he was there on the cross, I think also Jesus was addressing every succeeding generation, including you and me. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, every time we think we have the answers on our own, every time that we think we know what's best for us on our own, every time that we believe that we know the way that we can go all on our own, we are essentially saying that we don't need God. We don't need to ask for direction and help and guidance. And when we think like that, when we believe like that, the words of Christ speak to us, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do.
Verily today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now when we expand this selection, which is our second word that Christ spoke from the cross, we find that it comes at the end of a conversation with two thieves on their own crosses alongside of Jesus. We find it as part of a conversation that Jesus did not begin himself. Thief number one taunted Jesus saying, if you are king of the Jews, come down from the cross and save us. Save yourself for that matter. The other thief shushed him saying, don't you know we're getting what we deserved? We are thieves. Jesus doesn't deserve this. And then the second thief turned to Jesus saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Then we get Jesus' answer from the cross. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What can we learn from this simple conversation? I think I can learn that when we take Jesus seriously, when we take him at his word, we are closer to sanity and salvation than when we don't. Where would you like to be? That's the question we all get to answer.
Scripture in John 19, 26 through 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. I was asked yesterday to say a word at the funeral of a 21-year-old boy who, had, who I've known since he was born and was a friend of my son's. And so I began to think that day about what Mary must have felt as she watched her son dying on the cross. What must she have been thinking in the midst of that brutal crucifixion of her oldest son, Jesus? And he says to her, he calls to her from the cross and tells her that this disciple is now her son and that she is now his mother. In the midst of his agony, at the height of his suffering, he is most concerned for those closest to him. This is not my son, she must have thought. You are my son. This is my son's friend. He is about your age. He is strong and vital, just as you were only this morning, before they began to do to you what they are doing now, before they drove nails into your hands as if they were blocks of wood, before this happened to my baby. Now we stand and watch, your friend and I. I cannot bear to see, but neither can I bear to leave and neither can he. And so, I do love him. I love him for staying. So I will not argue with you about this now. I won't allow our last talk to be an argument. And there isn't anything else I can do to help you since they won't let me come near you. I can't brush your hair out of your eyes. You are going quickly now. So, all right. When this is over, it will be your friend and I. I will love him because he will remember you, and you will be all I'll want to talk about for a long time after this is over, long after most people think it's time I got over it. But there was a time you lived in me. I held you safe right here under my heart. You were a part of my body then. I would be a part of yours now. I would leap up to take your place. I would look down at you looking up at me and I would see your chest heave with your crying, and mine would heave with my failing breath, and I would shout, He lives, and send my last breath to the sky.
Sooner or later, each of us comes to this place in life where all we can see is hatred, betrayal, bitterness, or forsakenness. What are you going to do? Or an even bigger question is, who are you going to call? The atheist has an easy answer. Anybody but God. Believers seem to have a more difficult time with this question. After all, surely there must be someone to blame for our difficulties. Surely if Pilate had done his job as a just judge, this wouldn't be happening. Surely if the executioners had had a conscience, they would have refused to do their work. After all, why would a loving, creating, caring, forgiving God allow what we call hardships? Notice what Jesus does. He goes right to the top with his complaint. O oh my Father, why hast thou forsaken me? The example of Jesus suggests that we can do best when we take our complaint right to the top also. As a minister, I can listen and console when people tell me their forsaken stories. But what I really need to do in an appropriate way is to let them know it is okay to take your complaint directly to God.
John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29 say, After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Jesus suffered hours of abuse at the hands of the soldiers, and if that wasn't enough, he then spent even longer hanging from the cross, and so he must have lost a significant amount of blood and sweat during this suffering time. <clears throat> so it should come as no surprise to us that Jesus was thirsty. He must have been overwhelmed by his thirst. We know that thirst can drive all other thoughts from our minds as our bodies seek to replenish the fluids that we have lost. Jesus' thirst shows us his humanity and is a vivid reminder of the pain and suffering he had to endure. His thirst on the cross reminds us of our own thirst, our thirst for the living water that he offered us. And so his simple statement of his thirst, with all the humanity that it evokes, reminds us of the price that he paid for us so that we might have the living water that he offers to us even today.
<clears throat> Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I believe these words are a sign that Jesus is ultimately committing himself to God and to God's way. Remember, just a few days earlier, right before Jesus was arrested, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was struggling. He was struggling because he could not see, he could not understand how what was about to happen could possibly further the kingdom of God. He didn't know the particulars. He didn't need to know the particulars. But he knew that he was going to be arrested and put to death. And this was his struggle. How can that further the kingdom of God? How many times have we found ourselves in a similar situation? Something happens. Maybe, maybe it's the loss of a job. Or maybe, maybe we experience a divorce. Or we develop a serious illness. Or death comes to a loved one of ours. And we wonder, how in the world can anything possibly good come out of this situation, this hurt, this pain? Or maybe something doesn't happen that we desperately wanted to happen. And we say the same thing. How can anything possibly good come out of this hurt, this pain, this disappointment? And when we experience that and we begin saying that or thinking that, we have a choice to make. We can either be bitter and disillusion from that point on, or, like Christ, we can trust and believe that somehow God will be able to redeem that experience. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Do we have that kind of commitment?
Would you please rise in addiction response? And for the benediction, I simply make this statement. As you leave this worship service following the benediction response, take with you the thoughts and the emotions that you have experienced, remembering what Christ suffered for you and for me. It will make next Sunday, Easter Sunday, an even more meaningful celebration. <laughs>